In this Revit tutorial, I unpack how to build complex Revit railing systems, just like the one on the screen now. Stick around to find out more. Welcome to Power Search, where I show you everything that I know about Revit. If you are visiting today, don't forget to click subscribe so that you don't miss out on any future content. The best place to start is to understand the railing system geometry. That is, all the separate parts that make up the final railing system. The railing system demonstrated on the screen includes a series of subfamilies in some shape or form. Most people struggle with railing system construction stems from a lack of understanding of how these separate parts work. With that in mind, let's dive in deeper and unpack these components. Highlighted now are the separate components and subsystems that are used in the Revit model. The first component to unpack is the end post. Revit calls these balusters. In the type properties, these are controlled from within the second edit button. Down on the lower half of the dialog, find start post, which is now highlighted in the preview window. The start post family is located in the project browser under the families tab and then again under the railings tab. I will now edit this component. To create your own start posts, start on the file tab, then click new and then family. From the available templates, choose ballast the post. You can use the default parameters within the template or create your own. Switching back to the demonstrated example, Notice the highlighted nested components. These help add detail. The complexity in the example railing system is found in the inclined handrail, which just comes down to sound modeling techniques. Using the view cube, I can rotate the view to demonstrate the incline. As I click on that element, it is possible to see how it was made, which is using a sweep. The sweep path has been drawn on an angle to enable the required incline. I will now delete it and recreate it in session to show you how this can be achieved. Start by clicking create and then on the ribbon pick sweep. Following this move to the floor plan view. From here we can define a work plane. Pick the plane that cuts across the post, which will take you to the front elevation. Draw a reference plane in the required incline angle. Then reset the work plane so that it is hosted to that inclined reference plane. This will then take you to the left elevation. From here, it is possible to sketch the sweep path. Use pre-drawn reference lines to help you sketch. Then use the sketch tools to achieve the desired path as shown. The path is now set and a profile needs to be defined. Host the profile on the red dot. The profile is a circle, but because this view is hosted to the inclined work plane, the profile is also inclined and appears as an ellipse. And here we have the completed sweep extrusion. This can now be loaded into the project. Another feature of post families is that these can be parametric. As I zoom in here, we can see the fixing plate hosted to the ramp. As I switch views to a sectional view, this becomes more obvious. Parameters can be added to a post family, which allow this to flex in place depending on the slope required for your project. Let's have a look at how to do that. We are now in the post family. I can switch to the left elevation and I can zoom into the target area, which is the base of the post. In the type properties, I have separated the parameters created by me from the default parameters. Let's focus on determination fixing. 
Here, I have two options, one for the flat surfaces and another for slopes. For clarity, I will hide the flat option. Create a diagonal reference plane. This will enable the transfer of slope angle. Give this plane a name. This is very important. Above this, there is another reference plane. This will control the elbow. Next, add a reference line and lock the top of this line to the upper reference plane. This will control the elbow bend. At this point, I will also hide the post for the flat surfaces. The selected post is a sweep with its path hosted onto the added reference line. Notice this path segment is also locked at the reference planes to the bottom and the top. The next step is to place the termination fixing. Switch to a plan view. From the nested components, right click to create an instance. From there, move up to the ribbon and pick set work plane. Move to plane placement on the options bar and select the diagonal plane created previously. This is why naming the plane was so important. In the left elevation, we can now see the termination, but it is upside down. This can be flipped. Using the align command, position the termination so that it is locked to the reference line. Finally, apply the visibility constraint so that this element is only visible in the angled option. These steps can be repeated to add parametric controls for the other nested components in the family. Here is the flat connector option. And now to create the angled connector, draw and name a diagonal reference plane, just like before. Switch to plan view and find the connector in the nested components list and then right click to create the instance. Then repeat the steps for setting the host work plane. Switch back to elevation view to correctly align the instance. Because the connector is leaning away from us, the align command will not work, but I can click a midpoint and move it into position so that it snaps onto the vertical reference plane. Following this, switch views to the front elevation. The connector is slightly angled in this view because it is hosted on that angled work plane. However, because that work plane is parametric, I can alter the parameter value to help me with placing the component correctly. I can set this to zero and now the connector has flattened and I can correctly move the connector into position. Now, the angled connector is directly on top of the flat connector and a warning has appeared. So I need to re-establish the top rail connector parameter which no longer works because it is over constrained. So I remove the constraints and now I can reselect the dimension and from the label tool reapply the parameter. As I do that it snaps back to the original value of 3 from here, I can apply the visibility constraints and flex the parameters to check if they work. Finally, I need to check the visibility constraints. I do this in a 3D view. And then on the view control bar, I can toggle the preview visibility button. And now, as I toggle between the parameters, I can preview the end result. Here is the angled constraint. And moving up to the top rail connector, I can alter that parameter value to something more pronounced. Now we can start to investigate the handrail arrangements. Over on the type properties I can show you the various handrail types used in this model. 
each with their own settings. Let's look at these settings a little deeper. The best way to understand this is to toggle the preview button. And what I'm doing here is starting with the top rail and the height of that rail. So as I change this value, you will be able to see the top rail move down in the preview window. Importantly, this top rail has its own type, which I can access by clicking in here. I can now access the key properties for that specific handrail. And the keys in this instance are the rail profile, which is a 50 mil circle, and also the hand clearance. The handrail values don't mean much to you right now, but I do address this later in the tutorial. This rail type also includes a termination family, which are these highlighted squares. This termination family is listed over here on the project browser. I will switch over to a 3D view because it is very important with handrail construction that you understand what you are building first. And the best way to get that understanding is to provide yourself with references. For example, in this project, I prepared a series of sectional views from which to gather that information. And because of the prep work, I can easily extract any offsets. In this case, the value of 133 millimeters, which refers to the hand clearance value shown previously. Moving down the list, I can repeat this process for handrail one. This handrail has its own type because it contains some other terminations. Opening up the type properties for handrail one, here I set the hand clearance using the reference view as shown previously. The same 50 mil circular profile can be used. And the rail height can be predetermined from a sectional view using some reference planes. The key difference for handrail one is the use of terminations. The termination family is created separately and then applied to these parameters. There are two options for terminations. The most useful tip has been saved for last. Did you know that it is possible to create rail systems without the handrails? In other words, systems with only a post. From a duplicate type, remove all of the handrails. Then from the baluster settings, redefine the baluster family arrangements and the top rail host. And then back in the type properties, deselect the top rail. And there it is, a post only rail system, which can be placed at your convenience. This means that you don't have to wrestle with Revit's difficult baluster settings. To close out the tutorial, it is important to touch on rail sketching. Start on the architecture tab and find the railing button. Make a selection from the type selector and then immediately move back to the ribbon and click on pick new host. Click on the stair or ramp the rail should be hosted on and commence sketching. The rules here are start at the bottom and segment the sketch where each change of plane is a new segment. Refer to any standards, like this example, which states that the rail should extend beyond the first step by the length of one tread. Refine the sketch as required and be sure to take your time.
allow for any offsets required by any nested components, such as terminations. And remember, you don't have to get it right the first time. Use the 3D view to help and then go back and make any required adjustments. That's the end of the tutorial. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you learned something new. Please remember to subscribe, like and comment so that I can keep bringing you more content.